Hi, everyone. You're listening to Let's Side Connect. This is LT. And this is Ronnie. You might actually be watching us, or if you're not watching, you can go to uh, our Instagram page or our YouTube page as well. So Let's Side Connect. The video is going to be uploaded over there, and uh, that way you can see our faces and watch the whole conversation with our guest speaker today. And today we have, as I said, like a guest speaker, we're going to be talking about ACE, so Adverse Childhood Experiences, what it is, what it's not, and what are some of the uh, ramifications when it comes to mental health. And she's also going to be talking about an awesome project that she is she has put together and she wants to share with other people and bring attention again to this topic. Ron is going to present uh, uh, this guest speaker and I will go from there. Of course, thank you so much for that intro, LT. Super excited for today's podcast and specific, specifically for today's guest. So I'm not going to spoil it, but I will give a little bit of the bio and then we'll go ahead and introduce and get started with this conversation. Uh, so Samantha is the co-founder of the 16 Strong po Project and an adolescent mental well-being advocate. She mm -hmm. holds an, a Master's of Education of Human Development and Psychology from Harvard University. She created 16 Strong in response to what she experienced as a young person growing up with familiar mental illness and addiction. Her work focuses on empowering resilience to adverse childhood experiences through educational workshops, online resources, and community outreach. Outside of 16 Strong, Samantha works with the ESOL Lab at the Harvard Graduate School of Education on the Navigating SEL from the Inside Out Guide, as well as the Making Caring Common Project on resources for college admissions officers to assess character and applicants. Well, Thank you so much for joining us, Samantha. We really appreciate it. How are you? I'm doing okay. And thank you so much, both of you, for having me. I'm so excited to, to chat with you and, and anyone listening today. Yeah, awesome. Uh, that's what Let's Psych Connect is all about. We're psych connecting with other people out there and bringing attention to mental health. So without further ado, can you tell us a little bit more? I mean, yes, yeah, we read your bio, like we, talk, we, we gave uh, everyone a brief introduction here. But can you tell us uh, the background on why you started this project? Yeah, sure. Um, so I started the 16 Strong Project about two or three years ago. Um, Ronnie briefly touched on this in, in the bio, but I'll go into a little bit more deep detail. So my motivation for starting the project really stems from my own life experiences. Um, so I grew up with um, my father struggled with mental, both mental illness and addiction issues. Um, and that was something that impacted me throughout my childhood growing up. Um, and he hasn't been a part of my life actually since I was in middle school. And so throughout high school, I sort of struggled with understanding like what was going on, like how it was impacting me. And I was fully convinced that I was the absolute only kid in high school that was going through this, um, which was pretty challenging. Um, I overall had a really good a really good high school experience. Um, but there were these things that were always that would always come up as reminders of um, that brought it back to my mind of oh, this happened to you, or like, this is what's going on, and I never fully got it. I blamed myself because I was just a kid. I thought for sure if my parent was going through something or acting in a certain way that it had to have been my fault. And so I went through high school not really understanding. Um, I also went through high school as someone who um, was pretty high-performing academically, um, athletically, and I had a number, I had a great social group. I had a great group of friends as well, and so no one really checked on me. And so I sort of felt like I can't share anything because and no one's asking me what's wrong. And so I was sort of in this place where I didn't fully get it. And I felt like I had no one to go to because they just wouldn't understand. And so um, when I started the 16 Strong Project, it was an F in an effort to support kids like me, really, the next generation of kids who might be feeling the same way, um, going through certain situations that they might not understand and they might not even realize that they're going through or how it might be impacting them. And so I created 16 Strong as a way to help young people both recognize and then navigate certain challenges that come along with facing adverse childhood experiences. Um, so I mentioned I, my particular situation was growing up, my father struggled with mental illness and addiction, which we'll get into a little bit more about what adverse childhood experiences and ACEs are, um, but that falls into that category. And so that is where the project started. Yeah, 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 v uh, very good. So. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just ask a, a quick question. I think that's something that comes to mind and um, 
you mentioned that in high school you were very high performing and academically inclined and participated in many different groups. Um, and I think that that story kind of holds true for a lot of individuals. And I'm so happy yeah. you shared. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, but, you know, the individual who's who's striving, who's doing well, who mm -hmm. maybe people think that they don't have to check on. Um, but for you and your story, I think that that's um, the story of many adolescents, young adults uh, at that age where they feel, okay, well, um, you know, who do I talk to about this? Everybody right. thinks I'm fine. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was yeah. interesting. Yeah, and I will say that as I've started to share my story, because as I mentioned, I went through high school, I didn't talk about what was going on, but as I've gotten older and gotten more comfortable sharing my story, I have had that reaction from others who are like, that sounds exactly what I was like in high school and no one checked on me. Um, not the same issues, you know, so totally different stories, but similar response or reaction where they're kind of like, everyone thought I was fine. So then I convinced myself that I was fine um, and I didn't know who to talk to or what to say. So I yeah. would agree with that, that it does come up. Yeah, and, and it makes us wonder, you know, because we're often talking about uh, checking on people who might be going through something that we already know that it is negative, right? right? And that might be maybe showing like isolating behaviors or crying mm -hmm. or acting out in like going to substance and whatnot. So those are the individuals that we usually say, like, let's talk about, like, let's talk to them, right? Yeah. And then so for someone who, again, has the, the performance as a, like academic achievements, Overall, like we don't say like, "Hey, can you ask them how they today?" <laughs> exactly, um, and that's something I'll get into when I start talking about the program more. But something that I think about a lot, where um, I'll work with or talk to educators about the importance of being sure to check in on all of their students, for example, or even the student that they haven't heard from in a while, or the student that they think is fine or getting straight A's and things like that. So. Yeah, because some people, it's also another way of coping too, right? They're, coping, right. they're putting that attention towards that, and it takes attention away from whatever else is going on, and it's it's pulling their emotions out of that, so yeah. But, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. and, and I'll just add to that, LT, it's great thought, it kind of took it right out of my mind, um, and it's important for those educators and people in that position to also understand that there may be a difference in presentation, because when we say anxiety as adults and maybe even young adults, that may be that may look much more different in the adolescent population as well. So exactly. Um, so Samantha, the name 16 Strong, it's a very powerful name. It, it, it brings, I think, a lot of attention even when I say it. So <laughs> tell us a little bit more about where that name kind of comes from or if, where it originated. Yeah, so it comes from if you, if you have 24 hours in a day and in an absolute perfect ideal world, you're sleeping for eight of them, which is unfortunately not always the case, but for, you know, math and naming purposes, if you're sleeping for those eight hours every day, that leaves 16 hours that you're awake. And so 16 strong represents what it takes for an individual person to get through those 16 waking hours of the day, um, productively strong, um, and what that means for, for them. So what it means to be 16 strong will look different for everyone. So what I need to get through my 16 waking hours won't be the same as what you need, Ronnie, or what you need, LT, and won't be the same as someone else. You know, it might be, um, it might be listening to your favorite podcast in the morning. It might be listening to your favorite playlist that you made. It might be um, having a conversation with your sibling. It might be having a weekly conversation with a therapist. It could look like any number of things, but identifying what those things are for you to get through those um, 16 waking hours, um, especially if for everyone, but especially if you are someone who is facing a potentially, you know, adverse experience or a struggling, challenging situation, um, recognize what those things are that really make you go and, and thrive, really. I just want to say, wow. <laughs> One, it's, it's just, amazing right all the thoughts put into it you know maybe somebody who is a teenager or like a young adult might not see and put the value you know in all of that thought yet right, right? right. it's just it has so much meaning and, and that will something that will be something hopefully that they will carry forward with them anyways like maybe it doesn't make sense right then right but it will make a lot more sense yeah 
Exactly. And I think when I reflect back on my time, it's really the method, for lack of a better term, that I used. I just didn't know that it's what I was doing. So I played sports and that got me out of the house for hours and hours a day. I, you know, I studied hard. I always listened to music. I still always listen to music no matter what I'm doing or where I'm going. And so, and I still, you know, sports are still a big part of my life, unfortunately not playing anymore, but like exercising or watching sports on TV and things like that. So they are things that have stuck with me and they are still things that get me through the day. And of course, things have come and gone off that list as I go. But mm -hmm. I didn't know that those things were things that were really what made me go every day. <laughs> and it, to that point too, you know, uh, because those are ways that help you cope with uh, things mm -hmm. that are happening in your house yeah. and also other variables as well. So those we would call them, we would see them as adaptive ways of coping, right? And, but there's also a fine line here because depending on, uh, the investment and how much of your life and what uh, there's just so many variables on when it comes to that that can also lead it to a maladaptive way of coping with something and we also know that we can also talk about um if we're not dealing with not coping with something again in an adaptive way and most of the time it, it means talking about something it means facing that something then uh, uh it, it can lead to um negative consequences right exactly and that's so totally true and important to recognize as well mm -hmm. yeah so there's more that we want to talk to you about here and like about the program in itself what makes it so unique right because we do know of some other programs that are out there that seek to provide support to uh, um, you so what differentiates your program from the other ones yeah, so I think what differentiates 16 Strong is that we're really looking to take a proactive approach to youth mental health. So we're looking to potentially prevent some mental health challenges and substance abuse issues from developing before they begin. And so we do that by helping young people understand and recognize what it means to face adversity, how that can impact them or how it might be impacting them and what they can do about it. So how can they develop those adaptive methods of coping or, um, you know, positive coping mechanisms, um, strong support systems, learning the appropriate language to recognize or to express their situation, I should say. Um, and so we are looking to support young people in that journey of having that recognition um, and being able to process what that means for them, how it might be, you know, displaying or, or coming out in, in them in particular, and then going ahead and figuring out what works for them to cope positively and overcome those um, challenges and really become resilient. Um, so really, it's, it's thinking about how to prevent things like um, whether a mental health challenge might come from either uh, a negative coping mechanism. So if you you know, substance abuse or things like that as, an, as a negative coping mechanism in response to what you're seeing, or even as repeating the behavior that you might be seeing in your own home or developing depression or anxiety as a result of a negative or adverse situation. So we're really trying to get ahead of some of those factors um, by providing this recognition, this language, and these tools, strategies, and tips for overcoming that. Yeah, and, and for me, I think that that is one of the more special things about this program because there, there's so many great aspects, right? But I think that um, focusing on preventive care, right? And it's not so much preventive care, but I guess preventive psychoeducation. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of coin that term <laughs> if it's not already coined. Um, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> because there are a lot of, uh, you know, great, um, um, I guess, options out there for adolescent and youth mental health, um, as Elsie mentioned. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think that there is enough in the community uh, and even in our, in our education format where we're talking about mental health and what that looks like, right? Where we're talking about what a maladaptive coping skill is and why it's important to understand that now so it doesn't start to affect other areas of your life. Um, and also talk about what's okay and not okay in the home. Because if you think about a child growing up inside of a home where there are uh, maybe dangerous behaviors, impulsive behaviors, that individual may think, oh, okay, this is normal. This is right. how uh, so-and-so acts, so this is how I can act. You know, what's the problem? Um, so it's, it, it, a lot of it is just on lack of knowledge and kind of understanding. Really? Some of these some of these different interactions so that's that's, that's wonderful yeah. and i think with that you know it's important to think uh, uh like breaking the cycle right and like running yeah. just 
afraid to see this and I believe this is normal that's how adults should behave or how human beings should behave mm -hmm. uh, you know then it's going to lead to uh, for um uh, it's just going to continue that cycle over there that, you know, when it, it comes to a strong 16, you're basically trying to break that cycle. Like, Hey, yeah. let's talk about possible scenarios here and what's doing those scenarios. Um, so that you don't have yourself to suffer from substance abuse, from emotion abuse and et cetera, et cetera. And you also don't have to, you'll be the one who is committing all those actions as well. Exactly. So you, you nailed it um, with talking about breaking the cycle. That's a key component of what we think about. We think a lot about, um, you're not alone in what you're experiencing. So that's uh, goes back to the importance of talking about it and understanding it. Um, you're not to blame. Um, as I mentioned, it's so, it's just so easy for kids to be able to blame themselves for something that, um, you know, potentially a parent is, is displaying or a sibling family member or some other adverse um, experience they might be facing. And also you're not destined to continue the cycle. You can break the cycle is the other piece of it as well. Um, and giving that knowledge and, and recognition to hopefully support adolescents and young people in breaking that cycle um, and understanding that it's not a typical situation per se. Yeah. Because, uh, for instance, like I can remember, I can think of cases, uh, you know, people saying uh, that they have witnessed, let's say, the father being abused towards the mother for years and years and years, you know, and maybe they were like 10, 11, 12 years old. And they even tried to, let's say, um, defend the mother. So, you know, trying to interfere with that uh, scenario. But, and they felt guilty for not uh, being able to protect the mother, let's say. Yeah. And so for years and years and years, they carried for that feelings of guilt and that also led to feelings of worthlessness and other feelings and, and depression right and uh, possible ptsd and whatnot and then eventually what this person and other people that i've saw uh, or heard about as well they come to realize you know via therapy and also other experiences that uh they were just kids uh you know the 10 year old what else could have really done you know also if they didn't know maybe how to call 911 and why not right and, and so like it took so many years out of their lives right because yeah. they kept carrying that feelings of guilt and worthlessness it, again it leads to talking about mental health symptoms but before we talk about mental health here let's talk about adverse childhood experience what is that? Good question. Um, so adverse childhood experiences um, or ACEs, as you might hear me refer to them, or I might have already referred to them as, um, are potentially traumatic events that occur in um, young people before the age of 18. So they include things like having a parent or family member who struggles with mental illness or addiction, having an incarcerated parent, um, struggling, you know, facing emotional abuse or neglect, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and a number of, of other things are on the list as well. Um, is really the overarching definition of what an adverse childhood experiences or ACE is. Yeah, and I don't think enough people, I guess, are, would be is familiar with that. Right. Fashion per se, you know, um, so I, it's, it's good to be talking about it now and spreading that word, like, so that we raise awareness so that, again, we can do something about it because yeah. sometimes it helps to put a name right and I sometimes put in the name it's something that it's not helpful so we try to remove that name anyway yeah. it does help I feel like it it's true. And, and a quick side note on that is I wasn't familiar with the term ACEs or adverse childhood experiences until the last two or three years. And so when I first started this program, it was solely focused on supporting young people who had parents or family members struggling with mental illness or addiction, which I then came to realize is part of this broader category of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And everything I'm thinking about with this population is actually even more broadly applicable. And so that's when I started talking more in terms of adverse childhood experiences and ACEs um, to bring really more awareness to using that term and that phrase and grouping more things into that category that really do belong there and all of these topics that we're talking about fit on this broader scale so to that point yes it's not a well well and it's not a well enough known term in my opinion so it's important to talk about we agree we, we <laughs> fully agree and i'll also add in something that lt and i have talked about multiple times in the past i think the word um, trauma, and we don't use that word lightly, right? So yeah. we know that not all ACEs can be trauma, but there is a chance that when you do experience ACEs, you will also experience some trauma, right? Or yeah. some manifestation of trauma. Um, and, and, and I think that this is a good point to touch on and, and, and try to get out there is that, you know, trauma is usually associated with um, 
maybe military trauma, right? Or, or uh, 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 physical trauma, right? Um, but whatever is harmful to us, right? Whatever is, is either reinforcing a cycle of maladaptive behavior um, or something that we try to avoid altogether, that can be traumatic, right? And, and I think that that's a, that's a conversation that we need to add, have and not necessarily be scared of that word and say like, yes, you know, this is a type of trauma. This is my trauma. And I think the first step is, is really talking about it and kind of owning that trauma. Yeah. And to that note, you know, to that point, it's just, we often associate it to say, like trauma to something as maybe our life was in danger. And sometimes the life was not necessarily in danger, but it still changes the way you see your, yourself, the world and your future uh, and impact in a way that it's hard to trust others or, or you can't even trust yourself or there's feelings of guilt, right? It's all, all the negative core beliefs or limiting core beliefs that really hold you back and uh, limited ways that you also relate to other people because again of those experiences and how you dealt with them in the past because again with society you know and the way that it's been up to maybe recently in our generation we try to change all of that is that we're trying to um so back in the day up until not too long ago people didn't talk about their emotions right and we're trying to have coping skills and one of the coping skills would be communication definitely yeah, yeah, and and I'll also add to that, and we could probably go on and on <laughs> about, about that topic. But you know, having the understanding that you know, just because there is not a diagnosis attached to it, doesn't mean that it does not affect you. Okay, mm-hmm. and and I, I think so many times um, people are are kind of only impacted or swayed by those trigger words like major depressive disorder or generalized anxiety disorder, um, but most people aren't going to go to or seek out a a, a mental health provider to get diagnosed, right? So just because that name isn't attached to it, those symptoms are are still there and those symptoms are still real, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, the idea of uh, the name sometimes help, the name sometimes doesn't help. And it's important (laughs) to see the holistic uh, presentation here so that we can uh, provide the best approach to treat the patient. Uh, and so with that, it comes to like trying to understand about some of the mental health ramifications, you know, somebody who went through an ACE or ACEs, but what are some of the mental health outcomes? Yeah, so a few of the, or some of the mental health, potential mental health, mental health outcomes from facing ACEs can be things like um, depression, anxiety, um, PTSD, which I was just going to bring up as, you know, Ronnie, you mentioned that uh, trauma is often linked to military and, and same with the PTSD diagnosis. We often see a strong mm-hmm. association where uh, people often don't understand or don't, don't recognize that PTSD diagnosis can really come from any form of, of those traumas that we're talking about, um, not just returning from um, like military or, or military trauma in general. So um, that's definitely one. And we also see uh, substance abuse issues, whether it's uh, something that um, people go to as a coping mechanism, negative coping mechanism or maladaptive. Um, or um, yeah, that's, that's, those are the main yeah. ones I'd say that we see in response to ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. I would like to add to that list uh, something that I would talk to somebody who as a, as a mentor um, mm-hmm. and uh, she would actually do research on ACEs and she would often talk about childhood trauma experiences and how there's a stronger um, um, association uh, if you've had those type of experiences and I'll stick with pain. I am passionate about pain so I, I read a lot about pain. <laughs> so I try to understand a lot about pain and so those individuals are you know those children who have experienced with ACEs or went through they're more likely to um, report pain experiences, including fibromyalgia and other forms of chronic pain. Yep, and that's so true. It's um, ACEs, in addition to um, certain mental health situations or struggles, um, there are a number of physical implications as well that you often see more in the long term. Like you, meant, rep- like you mentioned, reporting chronic pain, um, if it's been linked to heart disease and a number of other physical health issues in addition to mental health issues that I don't think we often think about or talk about when we're thinking about these experiences, how they can really affect you physically in your body in addition to mentally. Yeah, there's, we're going to address in a different um, episode here, how like your body keeps a score and it keeps a score too. Very young, because there's a book out there. that (laughs) There is, that calls the body, it's called the body keeps the score. So yeah, (laughs) I'm sure that will be great. And I will 
listen, listen for it or look out for it too. So, <laughs> so think again, you know, since you were like little, right? You know, your body is yeah. more. And it really is. Ass later on. Yeah. Yep. Totally. So there's more here when, you know, when it comes to providing support to those uh, individuals, right? So uh, young adults, children. So what, are, what can the project do um, in order to provide that kind of support? Um, good question. So the project right now we work with, we connect with and partner with schools, um, as well as provide different online resources and online platforms. And so we partner with schools in a number of different ways. And our goal really is to work with predominantly school counselors to help them um, implement programs or materials or resources in their school that are, you know, a best fit sort of thing for them. And so we do have a workshop that was originally an in-person workshop, but given the current state of the world, it's, it's been <laughs> adapted to be online. Um, that is designed for middle school and high school students. And it's really an interactive way for, um, an interactive engaging way for young people to learn about ACEs and the potential impacts and what it means to develop positive coping mechanisms and what it means to develop a strong support system and, and express yourself using the appropriate language. Um, and so we, we, in the workshops, we have a number of um, small group activities, reflective activity activities um, in order to try and get every, all of the students' voices involved and in the work we're doing. Um, not very much lecture-based. Um, teenagers don't usually want to listen to an adult talking for that long. So we do have that workshop option. Um, however, that's a little bit more, a little bit more of a commitment, although schools have definitely been up for it. Um, and then we also have different, a number of like lighter lift materials. So we're able to provide resources for educators and school personnel on sort of what we were talking about earlier, the importance of understanding, listening to, um, and really hearing and believing their students and their experiences and how they can support them and these are ways that they can really just think about who is in their classes, um, who they're working with on a daily basis, what they may have going on, what that might show up as, what it might not show up as, um, and ways to respond to students that are supportive rather than harmful. So um, you know, example I often use is that if a student finally like gets up the courage to go talk to someone and, and share with someone and for some reason they feel really comfortable talking to their math teacher, but the math teacher doesn't know how to respond and so they turn around and they say something like, um, I don't know, like I teach math, like go talk to the counselor or something like that. Um, while it's not intentionally harmful, that student is likely not going to go speak to someone else because it was already challenging enough for them to go bring this up to their math teacher and so our resources for educators really provide ways simple ways that you can respond in a positive way and a supportive way to be able to help the student that comes to you um the it we talk about the importance of helping um of what was i going to say of helping um helping start conversations with people that they are students that they haven't checked in on in in a while um and what that what that conversation starter might look like. So examples of conversation starters, um, open-ended questions rather than closed-ended questions, things like that. And, and also just educating on what ACEs are, what adverse childhood experiences are, um, because um, like we were talking about earlier, it's not a phrase that's used particularly often, um, especially in the education world. And so mm -hmm. it's an important thing for people working with students to, or working with students to really understand. So we have an assortment of of materials that can be used, whether it's a commitment to a full workshop or professional development program, or if schools are more interested in raising awareness and, and using more lighter lift materials and just starting starting the conversation and talking about it and at least introducing it and being aware of it. Again, wonderful project. I'll keep, on, I'll keep saying Thank that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Like we go back in time, you know, and start developing this project, so we all can benefit from it. I here. know. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, honestly. Why didn't you do it earlier? I'm joking. I'm joking. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know until I was of a certain course. age, yeah. which goes back to the issue here and why we should have had it sooner. But you know, <laughs> we're here now. Exactly. <laughs> Better now, you know, and you're behind it, uh, you know. And, uh, because of your story, you know, and yeah. your stories, I should say, uh, there's a passion behind it, there's value to you, and uh, people usually see that, you know, when there's passion uh, that is driving people to, to implement something. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I do yeah. want to 
question. We haven't touched on the subject, uh, and um, so I'm just wondering again if it's something that you has you guys have addressed it or not, and if you maybe plan or could plan on addressing in the future. Uh, so it's talking about um, so this um, students right or, or whoever is attending a workshop about suicide, you know, because we see that the, the rates aren't going up when it comes to suicide among teens. And so I was just wondering if the project addresses that as well. Not, I wouldn't say it directly addresses it, um, but it is something that does come up. Um, so when that being said, the workshops, when they are run with students, there's always a counselor. There always has been a counselor, mental health professional involved for that reason, because these are topics that do come up. Um, <laughs> but the program itself does not directly address it per se, but it is something that uh, could be. In, included because it is obviously an incredibly important thing to to talk about and recognize. Yeah, and we even have in our um, suicide uh, prevention series, we yeah. talk about studies that have actually tried to address um, suicide conversation, the topic itself among uh, students from high school and uh, how important it was to actually have these type of conversations and provide type of education and get them involved in projects to talk about it, you know, and it show like it helped them so yeah yeah so so i do i do want to say two things that i think uh, is so great about uh what you're doing samantha number one when doing the workshops with the educators lt and i have talked about before um I think off recording maybe about how long or how much time adolescents spend um, at school, right? And and that same token, educators spend um, a great deal of time at the school interacting with the the uh, the uh, young adults, adolescents, um, and I think it's it's so important for them to kind of understand, you know, how each person can present individually um, and we talked about it a little bit before but it's, it's great that you're actually going out there reaching out to these to these schools working with these educators and saying you know listen these situations are going to come up and and this is how to deal with x situation versus y and to that point i'll, I'll also add that i love the fact that the students are are getting exposed to these workshops as well because not only can they kind of understand this the the uh, the impact and, and, and importance of, of ACEs, and if they're even going through one at the moment, but also uh, with their friends and peers. Um, yep. So just as it's important for educators to be able to understand, okay, something isn't right here, something is wrong. Um, it is our duty, uh, well, not our duty, but but you know, if, if, if our friends are going through a difficult time, right? Or if there's something that maybe seems off, giving them kind of the courage or the tools, right, from the workshop um, to say something about it, speak up about it, maybe reaching out to another adult as well. Yeah, and that's that's so true. And I actually was talking to someone earlier today, and I was telling them, and what I'm going to mention here as well is that I I often say, or I like to say that this isn't like this program is not for it. Well, it is for those who have identified as those who have experience as someone who has experienced an ACE or is having a, a mental health struggle, but it's also for everyone. It's really a program for everyone. And so the workshops that I've run previously are not with a group of students who have been identified, whether it's self-identified or from a mental health professional. It's really with just a group of high school students. I don't know, I haven't known necessarily the makeup of that group of students um, in terms of their adversities or their challenges. And so to your point, Ronnie, it's so important, I think, for all students because we, you know, the studies have shown that uh, two thirds of people have experienced at least one ACE by the time they're 18. So we're looking at the majority of people. And so um, it's so important to be able to support someone else or talk to your peers and classmates about it and normalize the conversation to make people feel comfortable and also know how to be there to um, support them in seeking help or coping positively and things like that. Um, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it Reminds me of a study, and it, the authors escape my name, but this one um, was on a college campus. Um, I think we, we, we probably discussed it, um, where they um, called these individuals kind of gatekeepers, right? So uh, they, would, they would get a bunch of information in terms of psychoeducation and what different things look like, what um, at-risk behaviors look like, and they were the gatekeepers of their um, campus, right? And, and um, if 
a individual or a student was not, um, you know, maybe didn't feel that they wanted to go to an adult about it or to um, anybody above them. Uh, there were gatekeepers placed around that had this information and, and knew kind of the different outlets and who to reach out to for that. And, and in a way, it sounds that sounds like this workshop produces just a lot of gatekeepers, right? So maybe if that, that information doesn't necessarily stick right away, right? Or they might they may not know what to do with it right away. Um, I, I think it's, it plants that seed for down the road when there is a situation, they can kind of revert back to some of the things and some of the the, uh, the verbiage that they heard in the workshop. Yeah. I wonder if it as a result uh, raises uh, levels of empathy will uh, increase later on, not only like right after the workshop and whatnot, but also later in life. And so put for thought, you know, I love research. Yeah. <laughs> I know I know I agree I hope I hope to see that 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 is the case in, in the long run um, and and I just also wanted to add one more thing when you mentioned gatekeepers I really I really love that term um, I had heard it before but it wasn't something I've heard recently and so another portion of our program is we're working on recruiting a youth advisory board and so that's sort of along the lines of this gatekeeper idea um, where we are looking for, and we have some students on board and we're looking for a few more who are um, really part of the work we're doing. And so not only are they individuals who can bring certain student facing resources, posters, flyers, awareness to their school, um, maybe if it's a school that's not you know, adopting our workshop or our other materials, materials or something, they're individuals that can bring it to their schools, they can educate it and distribute the information to their classmates and peers. Um, and they also are able to give their input really on what they want to learn about, what they, how they want to learn about it, um, like in what format, what's engaging for them um, to really keep them interested. It can be a, obviously a difficult and challenging topic and it can bring about some realizations that can um, then cause further, you know, self-exploration and self-thought and, and things yeah. like that. And so um, we want to know how kids want to learn about it and how young people want to learn about it and hear about it. And so we are engaging the voices of those who we're trying to support in the work that we're doing. And that's something new that we're working towards this year. I think it's always important. I think it's especially important when we all feel somewhat disconnected in a way since we're all remotely um, and seeing each other through screens. So I think it's important for that reason too. Mm -hmm. And we also, I mean, research has shown that there are a lot of people out there that learn from like doing hands-on experience, right? Some people yeah. be involved, not just like learning. Yeah, some people are just, I just need, need to read something and I'm good to go. Yeah. Other people need to be hands-on and sometimes there are different layers and get people involved, plus reading, plus the, the, uh, the lessons and whatnot. So it helps people from different, um, I guess, avenues, yeah. Totally. Oh. It also, sorry, one more thing that um, <laughs> I've also seen in research that students often learn a lot from peer to peer teaching mm -hmm. and, and distribution rather than from an adult to a, to a child. So I think there's some value in that as well. There's something about adults and childhood. Child I know, <laughs> especially <laughs> teenagers. <laughs> So, so my vote is that we just get this into the curriculum of 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 each school, right? Yeah. Uh, and push that so we uh, kind of breed, or you all, excuse me, kind of breed this um, new new age, a new generation of um, you know um, mental health competent individuals, um, very empathetic, as, as as LT mentioned. So it all it all starts with your project. So let's yeah. get it in the curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it were up to me, Ronnie, your vote would count for all of the schools, at least in this country, because that is the dream. So <laughs> hopefully it has some weight, your, your vote over here. <laughs> and it, sometimes it's about, again, like uh, research, right? And uh, getting, gathering all this data, and it might take me about a year or a couple of yeah. years in to show people see it works and exactly we'll trust you more <laughs> exactly exactly more than just taking my word from it for it but yes it's we're getting there with that for sure <laughs> exactly and then it tells our, uh, our uh, uh, okay <laughs> it tells our audience to uh, how important like research is and to be familiar yeah. with research because it does inform our work 
not mm-hmm. just if a client like you know face to face in terms of therapy but also other type of projects that we want to um get involved in a lot of it is informed by research and totally. if you have to be informed you know because your your project you know there's a lot of research to back up yeah but now we need that research to support your projects so that it right it's a whole cycle of research <laughs> yes research does inform the project and the program that we developed and now the research will need to come to support the success and positive outcomes of the project in the future. If I said that right, <laughs> I think I did. And when I publish that article, call us again, you know, and then we can talk about all those results. Yes. We love, love research. <laughs> <laughs> so this has been great so far and I know we're getting close to an end but I want to ask you if there's something else about the project you know our, our aces that you wanted to share with our listeners um I think I covered most of it we're really just looking to raise awareness and bring attention to adverse childhood experiences aces their impacts and the fact that there are things that we can do to prevent or, or, or mitigate some of those negative challenges that come along with it. And it really all starts with understanding, recognition, knowledge, and, and realizing what we can do, like developing positive coping mechanisms um, and, and strong support systems in response to those ACEs. But it really does all start with the understanding and recognition piece and, and going from there. But that is really what we're looking to do is, is raise awareness and empower resilience among young people. And we have a number of different ways that we're doing so. Higher commitment, lower commitment, involving, involving the youth. And, and so that, that really covers it all. Yeah. So thank you for that. Ronnie, do, do you have anything else you want to add to this? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just say, you know, thank you so much, Samantha. It's, it's been amazing talking to you and, and what you're doing. I know that we, we had a lot of laughs, uh, a great time in this episode, but the fact of the matter is what you're doing is going to be very impactful um, for, you know, the thousands, probably millions of, of, of children um, who are kind of suffering in silence, right? And, and I don't use that term lightly and, and um, maybe not even knowing uh, the amount of suffering that they are um, taking in at the moment. So um, I really appreciate what you're doing um, and I hope that we, we can give this as much exposure as possible and, and we, we can continue to push this, this idea. Yeah, thank you so much. That that means a lot. And you you nailed it. I use the term suffer in silence um, often when we're talking about this work and the importance of helping those who are suffering in silence, unfortunately. So thank you so much. And when Ronnie said, you know, we hope that your project reaches um, millions of children. And it just, I thought like, well, let's get around the world, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah cause- <laughs> The other nonprofits and whatnot will be connected with you guys too, and there will be opportunities to spread the world, uh, the word right. around the world. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> well, thank you again, and uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, connect with you. I'm sure there will be other opportunities to you. How would uh, our listeners, uh, our audience, get in touch with you or learn more about the project? Sure. So we're, our website is 16strongproject.com. Um, and we are also on social media, predominantly Instagram at 16strongproject as well. Um, email is, or we have contact forms on our website, but it's also just 16strongproject at gmail.com. So it's pretty consistent there. Um, and that's, that's the best way. There's a number of, um, there's a lot of information on our website, a number of different resources that we've recently added. And so that's probably the best thing to check out along with our Instagram. Awesome. And if you guys didn't get that, that's okay as well. We'll definitely be tagging uh, Samantha, the project, uh, in our social media platforms, also, also uh, our website, because now we have a page with uh, all our episodes and our website too. Uh, and click on the link, listen to the episode, or watch the video on YouTube or our Instagram. If you guys um, want to stay side connected in between episodes, again, just follow us or stay side connected on Instagram. YouTube. We're also on Twitter and Facebook. Let's I Connect. And if you want to send us an email, send it to discussion at letsiconnect.com. Our website is letsiconnect.com. And remember, <laughs> let's I Connect. <laughs>